My name is Jeffrey Kahn, and I'm the host of Digital Oil & Gas, the podcast that looks at the impact of digital technology on the oil and gas industry. If you want to discuss this week's topic further, or just stay in touch, you can always reach me at Jeffrey Kahn on Twitter or at JeffreyCahn.com. Welcome back to another episode of Digital Oil & Gas. My name is Jeffrey Kahn, and I'm the host of the uh, podcast. And today I'm joined by Chantal Milloy, who is the Chief Operating Officer of Level. Uh, Chantal, welcome to uh, Digital Oil & Gas. Thanks, Jeffrey. Thanks for having me. And uh, so we're all coping with pandemic-related uh, isolation and quarantine. And uh, so uh, today we're a podcast is going to dig a little bit into what it's like and how life is different in um, implementing change when your workforce might not actually be all in the office. So it might be might yeah. be a little different. <laughs> A little challenging for sure, right? Yeah. But let's uh, just to start, um, uh, Chantal, I know that you're uh, uh, in your role as chief operating officer, um, you're, you're, you have a more of a day-to-day operational responsibility, but why don't you tell us uh, give me a little bit about your, your background, how you ended up as a, as a tech entrepreneur, and, um, and then we'll turn into the, to talk a little bit about the kind of work that you're doing. Yeah, you bet. My background is really rooted in uh, technology from way back, starting in the web development days before web development was even a known thing. So. I, I predate. <laughs> I predate the web. I, I I tell my children I'm older than dirt, and and they they believe it. So yeah, I, I do actually remember the the dial up service in Calgary that we were all trying to jump on there as <laughs> slow and painful as that was. Uh, at the time, but my background really started there in uh, in technology anyways, in um, uh, back in the web days, web development, and that moved into several tech roles over the years in telecommunications mainly. Uh, oh. I come from a background of TELUS and Shaw and uh, um, broad knowledge there of all technology related to products uh, and those organizations. And that really led me to roles in bridge roles, I call them, What where my talent started to emerge was dealing with um, layman's terms and translation of technology. I had oh, a deep understanding there. Sure. But working with VPs and, and, uh, and the leadership teams on how that was going to be realized for them. Yeah, there's a, uh, I mean, this is a, a parallel to my own career. You know, we, I, I operate at the intersection of digital technologies and oil and gas, and I serve as a kind of bridge to help translate the terminology from one of those, one of those domains to the other. And back and, and back again. And uh, and it sounds like you had a similar role in the technology industry. Yeah, exactly. Really, really similar. And I think that that is really what was born of change management. Yeah. And a lot of the work that we do now uh, at Level uh, and that experience that we bring to customers now in oil and gas sector, but also in, in our you know past roots in telecommunications uh, in many industries actually now, because what we all know is that managing change and helping people through change mm. is all about the people regardless of the industry you know the same principles apply it's yeah, very true and i think a lot of parents are now discovering the, the the reality of this was they try and homeschool children you know this is a change management exercise of of some significance uh, yeah it really, it really is like you're dealing with as as you just said you know whether you've got two spouses or two partners in the home trying to now do their day jobs yeah. uh, on top of managing the kids' schedules and school and becoming teachers. Uh, boy, what what a unprecedented change, as we know. This is not something that anyone planned going into, but it does have us look at what advantages it can have as well, right? Yeah, very I mean, true. You and I have talked about that before. On we could, you could take you could take these things and look at the uh, the uh, abilities that we now have that weren't available to us you know, prior this time. And so just to, to, uh, stepping back for a second, can you tell me a little bit about what level is and does? What What is it that you do? I know it, it's in the area of, ch- of implementing change, but perhaps you could just elaborate a bit for us, please. Yeah, for sure. We're a technology services and consulting organization. So we were started in 2015 in Western Canada was our roots in Calgary to begin with as, as an IT staffing organization. So that is where it began. But since then, we've really expanded across the country in four lines of business. So not only staffing uh, and beyond IT as well, but organizational change management and change consulting uh, became a real primary line for us back in 2016. 
And then more recently, two new lines of business for us with two really important strategic partnerships that we have. One is our quality assurance testing with a group of fantastic women that are certified in the quality assurance testing in Rwanda uh, and our partnership with Marajo. And, uh, and then our fourth line of business is management consulting. And uh, on the change side, we also have a really important partnership with Lamarche Global out of the U.S. because they, they are um, pioneers 40 years in change and we are the licensed affiliate for their managed change model that we use when we help our customers get hmm. through change. So you've been you know, at a, a lifetime or a career, if you like, in helping organizations embrace change. So uh, it's my assertion in, uh, that implementing digital technologies in organizations is different from inter- implementing other kinds of change. And um, I wonder if you're, you know, what is your perspective on that? Do you do you see um, distinctions that are worth uh, dwelling on when it comes to uh, tackling the implementation of digital technologies? It's a really good question. It's one that we've debated a lot in our circles as well, because one point of view is it's actually not different. Yeah. You know, that's one point Technology is technology. Yeah. Yeah. And at the end of the day, whether the tech is different, and it is certainly from before and now, the determining factor of getting people through change, whether it's digital change or technology use or other change, is still about understanding what people need understanding what their issues are, and then understanding how to help them through it. So everybody has varying degrees of skill, you know, so maybe you're dealing with a group of people that are really skilled in technology. Maybe you're dealing with another group of people that are not. The journey for that person is going to be unique to them. Hmm. So it's almost on the side what the technology is. It's what does it mean for you and where are you starting from? And what help do we need to get that workforce through in order to adopt it? It's really the heart of change management. Yeah. I I mean, going back in my own career, I worked for a period of time, very briefly, with a auto glass manufacturing company who was implementing uh, new systems for the management of the business. And those systems included a, a kiosks and keyboards and consoles that would going to be deployed directly onto the shop floor where the auto glass work was done. And the, the, the struggle we had was that the, the people who were doing the auto glass installation needed to be able to lift up very, very heavy pieces of glass and maneuver them into place. And not surprisingly, these would, were largely burly guys, big burly guys. Yeah. And the industry attracted big burly guys to do this. And, uh, you know, the the workplace was uh, greasy and lots of lubricants and lots of um, uh, e- epoxies and glues to hold the windows in place. And it was it was proving almost impossible for the workforce to, you know, in, in one minute <laughs> be lifting up this very heavy piece of glass, get, getting covered with epoxy. And then in the very next minute being asked, please go over this keyboard and type in some so the results of your work. And not surprisingly, the change issue was a disaster. Um, yes. And but now, but one of the reasons they told us it was really sh- a struggle for them professionally was that they had never worked with a keyboard. They had no experience at all with com- computers. They didn't know what a mouse was, and so the, the whole user interface was was uh, totally foreign to them. Today, though, those same burly guys probably have smartphones in their pockets. They probably use the phones to do all kinds of clever things. Yeah, and if, yeah. so if I'm bringing technology into that workforce where their base level of understanding of technology is a little higher, mm-hmm. I, I think what I hear you saying is you start the journey where they are, which may mean for certain kinds of implementations at a higher level of understanding of technology than, say, I might have experienced back in the 80s. Is, yeah. is that a fair way to think about it? Or? It is. It really is. It's exactly right. If, if you think of any group, even in today's time, you are going to have some folks that are much more advanced in in what we would call maybe basic technology to another group is not basic technology. Uh, If they have very limited access, uh, if it's an older demographic that maybe has not grown up with, you know, the smartphone era or Mm -hmm. or the, the tools that they're dealing with today. So at the end of the day, you still have to understand where people are starting from regardless. So any change has different conditions. And if you don't 
This is what I've learned in my career and now what we advise clients on. If you don't do the work to understand exactly what the issues are for the different groups, you're going to put together plans that are going to only address a portion of them. Portion of those. You know? mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. Take, so take, you, take, walk me through an example of what, how this plays out in, in, in practice, if you don't mind. Like, uh, tell, tell, tell me a, a little story of, of, of um, say, implementing something digital in, a, in, our, in our modern era. And what, how, how is it different from implementing, say, in, in a, an, an earlier time? Yeah. So now if you think, actually, we've got a great example in front of us, don't we, with remote work. (laughs) I mean, this is the, you know, it's what everybody's talking about these days. As we know, not only COVID has pushed that to to new heights um, Mm -hmm. and to new needs, but organizations we know before this were all at varying degrees of readiness for that. Right to to actually bring their workforces remote and start working from home. You mean are you thinking about just technology or culture or both? All of it. Yeah, yeah, you're exactly right. I mean, technology Mm -hmm. is one because I think sometimes we assume that people are going to know their way around it, you know. And so if if we sent everybody home here on a remote from home and we assume that Mm -hmm. everybody knows how to hop on a video call Mm -hmm. and we assume that they're not going to have any audio or video challenges. What if they were a user uh, prior that um, always kind of got away with having someone else start those meetings? You know, it's a cultural, <laughs> cultural habits of where I'm weak or where I feel I'm weak compared yes. to others. That may not be true, but uh, is is to kind of get away with it. So you're at home, you're on your own, and you got to figure this out. So the if I think about helping people through change, this is a perfect example of understanding where people start places. Hmm. And to do the work there so that when you start your meetings now in our COVID era, you know, leaders really need to lean in. Leaders need to meet with their people regularly and start with some tech training. Yeah. You know, show the way. Yeah. Really, yeah show like, here's what we're going to do. Here's what we're going to use. No problem if your, you know, child pops in their face into the screen. <laughs> and also, no problem if you can't quite get that audio, we'll sort it out. You know, so that's that's new in our times today, but I don't know necessarily it's old tech or new tech, but again, where people find themselves depending on their experience level and their comfort level mm-hmm. with having to navigate uh, whatever technology is being put in front of them. But if I'm trying to deploy a change to a workforce that say numbers a thousand people, are you, do, do I actually have to go down to the person level or how do I, how do I abstract? Is there a way for me to uh, maybe group my thousand people to, uh, into classes or avatars or categories where I, I can say, all right, this group over here, you know, they're, they're going to need extra care. This group over here, technically very sophisticated and advanced, don't need a lot of attention. Is that how yeah. you think about it? Or how do I, how do I navigate yeah. when I, you know, deal with thou- when I'm dealing with a workforce that might number in the thousands? Yeah, exactly. You've, you've really hit on it there. There's no question if you're dealing with, as we do with our clients, an organization that's 15,000 employees, you know, yeah. versus 5,000 versus 2,000. Hmm. You're looking at getting a representative voice of that group. Yeah. And there are certainly a lot of ways and techniques, and it really depends on the company's culture. You know, some people do take really well to focus groups. Some take well to surveys. Some, uh, you know, in our work, we help deploy change agent networks. So that there's a representing voice of the people that work in that hallway and understand the pain. As long as you can find a way to represent the voice of what's happening in that area with Mm. true experience, not Mm. someone speaking for them, but someone who's lived it, you can get at those issues and concerns related to changes you're going through. And that's the heart of managing change and helping people do it. Because then you're exactly right. You don't want to waste. You only have the time you have. So mm-hmm. if you don't need to focus largely on a group that's pretty much quick to adopt, gets it, have worked with this new technology already, maybe we're part of the project team, you know, mm-hmm. to roll it out, then what do they need? Sure, they need some things. You don't want to ignore them, but they just need, might need, need those high level communication, you know, efforts to say, hey, we're doing this on this day. The others may need three, four workshops. Yeah. And that's where you want to focus the, you know, the limited resources you may have. Uh, you want to start with the highest priority and work your way down. And mm. for people, that's those that need more help at making the transition, usually because of skills. 
skill and will, you know, reskilling a workforce. Yeah, that's a yeah. big, big part of why we can't adopt a change. Yeah, that's part of certainly the, the one of the critical barriers to digital adoption in oil and gas concerns is the impossibility now of simply going to the market and hiring individuals who happen to be situated precisely in and available in the market with exactly the right understanding of both digital and oil and gas. Those, those people simply don't exist. It's like, yeah. it's like unicorn hunting. <laughs> you're, yeah. you're not going to yeah. find them. And yeah. uh, so the, yeah. yeah, the only way to move forward is to reskill the workforce to make the, the workforce uh, all better able to cope with the, these changes that are coming at them. I agree. And you know what? There's another conversation, too, that we're having, and uh, certainly with my colleagues in change and my partner in the U.S. about transformation. Now, mm. oil and gas, there are many transformations underway here in our market and in Calgary. Things have, just, of course, slightly shifted and changed through COVID, but in general we'll terms. Talk, we're going to talk about that next. How is it different? Talk about that next. There's, <laughs> but in general terms, there's definitely um, transformation efforts that are widespread right now. Absolutely, in oil and gas and beyond that. We're mm-hmm. seeing it across all industries and across North America. But what we have been talking about is the ability to take a large transformation can sometimes in itself feel overwhelming for people. And we put so much stock in saying it's this big, large mammoth beast. We're, we're doing, you know, we're transforming everything. When really, if we were to break down all of those large transformations into small bite-sized chunks of the changes that just impact the people at the time that it does, it would not feel so overwhelming and people would not, would would not feel that this big thing is always just around the corner. Yeah. Well, and I, I love that conversation on changing the way we look at transformation. Yeah. I think our, our work at home example now is uh, a, a great illustration of that. If you, if you had said to me in December, guess what? By March, uh, the entire workforce of North America will stop going to an office and and instead work from their homes, I would have laughed and said, not a chance. And yet here we are. And uh, I'm waiting to hear, I haven't heard it yet, but I, I'm, I, and I don't think I will. It's highly unlikely a business will declare bankruptcy because it's been unable to cope with Zoom or Google Hangouts or some other collaboration software. They won't be able to pin their, their failure to, to that because the technology is simply too easy to use and too, uh, too, too available. It's true. Yeah. it's true. But you're right. This event, um, you know, no one saw it coming. And you're right. This is one of those large scale transformations that was forced <laughs> upon us as a society. And we're, but and we're coping us, with it. And we're coping with it. And when we have to, we do. You yeah. know, this is I'm not saying in, in, to, to lighten this at all, because this will, to your point, put many businesses um, out of business. A lot of pressure, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and reinvent themselves. And, you know, we're certainly a small business that started five years ago, and we're in the midst of a growth curve when this hit. So, yeah. you know, this this has everybody um, look at stabilization again, which um, it does change uh, the current times of, of, uh, and attitudes of getting through this. And I think that's also unique across different sectors, oil and gas, you know, we, we look at the multitude of other issues that are also hitting that industry that were already hitting that industry yeah. when this occurred, you know, that's compounding now. Um, so there's no question. Let's turn to the, this whole question of the pandemic though. Uh, I talked to a lot of tech entrepreneurs and so far only one has told me, of, of, of the projects that they had underway, uh, only one has told me that the, uh, the projects are continuing. The vast majority have, 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 have said, look, whatever project I had underway is halted. The ability to implement change when you're not in the office apparently is a sufficiently big enough hurdle that the project owners and project managers said tools down and we'll deal with this post-pandemic. But one entrepreneur has told me that their projects are continuing. What's in your experience? What, what, how, how would you advise an organization that say was invested in driving some changes forward in as recently as March, and mm-hmm. should they stop, or should they be working to maintain momentum and drive change forward through the pandemic, even though you know we, we have these social distancing considerations now? Yeah, I think there is a real opportunity in what you're saying and, and, and uh, the individual you were speaking to as well is likely pointing to, which mm-hmm. is 
the opportunity to actually get things right and use this as a bit of a momentum built builder. So I do believe that some of these projects should continue um, at this time. And it every again, every industry and company is unique, so it's hard to make a blanket statement. But if you were to look at um, does the time afford you now to actually get much better operationally, let's say, operational efficiencies and things that an organization could be doing if they took the time to continue with advancement? Because you're never going to get this opportunity um, either to – sometimes slow down, let's say some activity has slowed down and clean up the shop, Mm. if you will. Mm. So to me, there's also this, and we've seen it because some of our clients certainly have stopped their projects. Uh, Others have continued. And funny enough, we we got a new one, which I would have never thought about two weeks ago. (laughs) But but so it depends on the industry. But what that has let us do as a, as a business is, turn inwards to getting our team focused on operational efficiencies, reducing and spend, uh, getting us ready so that when we're on the other side of this, we are that much more um, efficient and that much more ready to take, the, you know, what we hope is, a, you know, growth again, as we all do mm. in as soon as, as the fall. So I do think there's an opportunity to continue some things where the reaction might be to want to stop those things. Yeah. Well, I can I can certainly get the certainly in oil and gas when you think of the collapse in oil prices and what's that's done what that has done to revenue lines, the the natural reaction if you're a CFO right now is to suspend all non essential spend, and uh, project work could be viewed as non essential and um, and so uh, this I believe the standard response is shut it all down. But the, mm-hmm. the, there's, there's no, no doubt in my mind that some changes bring value the minute they go live. And there's a great, a great thing to do if you want to test out a, a technology or a solution or a process is test it out in a pandemic. <laughs> it's, this is the, you know, if you think about stress testing something, this has to be it, uh, is to see how, how, how does it work? Uh, some venture capitalists told me that, a pandemic is a great time to see how a management team can cope with with uh, if they're investing in a tech tech company. See how the management team copes with with stress <laughs> because of the, yeah, this, exactly. This brings no, it all exactly home. Right. There's been some good podcasts on that lately with Hercevec and and others like speaking about that exact topic. On yeah. venture capitalists will actually ask, "How did you fare through the pandemic? Yeah, what'd you do differently?" Uh, yeah, that's going to determine for me that I want to invest in your organization. In your organization, <laughs> yes. precisely right. Yeah, exactly. So I agree with you. But on the on the digital, uh, you know, if you look at the oil and gas sector, and we certainly have many clients in that sector, um, many of the projects that were underway and some that we were helping with in the way of managing change for those digital projects and transformations, they were already, many of them, underway on modern workplace modern workplace type programs and projects, which was about the video technology, work from home. Or work um, from anywhere. Yeah, Yeah, Yeah. or work from anywhere around the world, connect with anyone around the world. Hmm. Those were underway. The the interesting thing that happened through through COVID was those that sped that up, and we have a customer that did, uh, because it was like, now let's go. And others who, who actually almost halted a little as though we shouldn't, but realized, you know, if, well, we have to, <laughs> but uh, they weren't far enough along uh, prior to that to be in a really good shape. It took them, it's taking them a lot longer to even get the basics or the spend to your point, to mm. be able to spend for what had not already been underway. Yeah. So yeah. you're seeing who was ready and you're seeing those that are operating now and sped those projects up. Um, that uh, that are benefiting from that now. And there there's a real new norm now. You know, it took us all two, three weeks to figure out what the heck. Like, I, I'm not sure how to operate like this. Yep. And I'm not seeing humans. So, you know, do they see me? Do they, <laughs> are we having a conversation? There's virtual coffee. What do we do here? Yeah. But we're, there is a new normal and we feel it now, right? People are finding their way as to how to connect in this new environment. Yeah. Well, as as, as, as uh, some wag once said, when the tide goes out, you see who's not wearing any swim trunks. Yeah, and so <laughs> the pandemic has pulled pulled the tide out, tide out, and and now we're seeing who didn't have ready to go infrastructure, whose business model hadn't really reacted well to this wave of change, who wasn't prepared for 
these sorts of, uh, um, you know, new, new, op- new ways of operating. So it'll be yeah. you know, time, time to shore things up. What are yeah. the, uh, in your experience, what, do, what are the leading companies doing differently uh, when it comes to implementing these newer digital solutions? What are they, what are they doing differently from say implementing, you know, uh, from the past where they're implementing uh, uh, other, other changes? Uh, it's a good question. What they're doing different depends on the organization, but I point to leadership. Mm. So, so again, is it the technology or is it the people? And I always go right to the people. Yeah. And we have in some ways gotten better with how leaders lead people through change. Mm. Uh, because we, as a society, we've learned how important that is. We don't always do it well. Uh, I think there's a long way to go, but many studies have been the, have been done in the past on transformations, whether digital or not. Um, the top top reason why things don't succeed is the involvement of the senior leaders mm-hmm. and their ability to lean in. So right now, those that are doing this really well and having a workforce that's working with the tools remotely successfully are the leaders that have really leaned in. Mm. Uh, be visible. You know, it's we're not able to walk into an office right now and see that leader um, in the hallway and and walk by or meet at the coffee yep. uh, station. So your your people as a leader need to see you, and they need to see you more. And mm-hmm. and leading into this, th- that's the type of it. Certainly, you know, counsel advice that we're working with some of our clients on is force it a little in the beginning. Um, you know, two meetings a week with your leadership teams, video on. Um, you know, do do the things that feel uncomfortable, mm. but once the leaders see that their leaders are leaning in, it's going to become normal a lot quicker. So, mm. again, whether it's technology old and new, I think behaviors and leadership styles have have changed over the years, and it's more diverse now, mm. which helps that conversation as well on how we show up as yeah. leaders. Yeah, and uh, what. Um what what aside from leadership and and um, uh, setting the tone from the top, uh, what else uh, do you see the leading companies do? Um, for instance, it, something that comes to my mind it would be if I'm if I'm trying to drive a change in my organization or transform the organization, and I'm working with digital technologies to drive the change. Would I lean on my on the same digital platforms or tools to help drive and communicate the change to as a kind of secondary signal about its importance um, uh, as a as a as a tactic? Is that something that leading companies do, or are they? Because I think your point earlier was the the, the the successful change often means meeting people where they are, but it, but if you're trying to get them to embrace a digital technology. Certainly one of the ways to do that is to say we're going to be, you know, carrying out this work using these tools rather than, oh, well, let's go and have a workshop with, uh, you know, with no technology in the room. Oh, for sure. And if I think what you're pointing to there is is using it live and and setting the tone for yeah, that. Yeah, setting the so, tone. Yeah, precisely. Absolutely. So, so there's no question. I mean, a leader that's going to advocate for we're moving to a new digital platform and then doesn't host their meeting with that digital platform. Yeah, that's <laughs> Yeah, what signal are you sending, right? <laughs> That's right. Yeah, so absolutely. Mo- and, and it goes to the behaviors, again, on modeling and getting good at it yourself. Yeah. And leaders taking the time, too, because, again, even, you know, a leader group is going to have a varying degree of experience with this technology. Just yes. because they're a leader it doesn't mean they're better or worse. And sometimes the, the staff are better, you know, than they personally are at working with that technology. So it's taking that time for yourself to be... Um, very adept with it, have mm-hmm. a lot of experience yourself and be able to show, but also show the humanity side of that, which is, Hey, I'm not perfect either. And, and whoops, my audio is not working. You know, uh, <laughs> well, it, you it and I, that. you and I, when we set up this podcast, we didn't, <laughs> technology didn't work. So what did we do? We rebooted. <laughs> exactly. We did the old working. reboot. We did, should always do first. <laughs> do the reboot. I've heard of uh, I've heard of reverse mentoring as a as a, a really good and practical way for uh, say a, a senior individual who's 
um, at, at a stage in their career where they're sufficiently distant from the technology and they're more in that leadership role that it's very challenging to you know suddenly become hands on with these sorts of tools and so they've put into place reverse mentoring roles where they have young people come in and provide them with coaching. Is this something that you know in practical terms is this kind of thing that you might see in in your experience? Well, I do love that what you're saying and it it is not something I've often seen. You know, if I look at have I seen that? No, but the concept I think is phenomenal and it plays really well within any change strategy on using the talents and skills of those around you in the office. To your point, whether it's a generational where you've highlighted the fact that there's a group of people that that some of the technology is just more innate. You know, they grew grew up with it. Yep. Um, What a great strategy. Uh, And uh, thanks for that. Yeah. (laughs) Well, it creates a, it's a kind of, yeah. it's a kind of vulnerability problem because if you're a senior person, you know, you, you, you're, and you're trying to project this, uh, this image of, uh, in command and in control and, and, um, you know, um, uh, uh, able to sail these, these very, very challenging waters and difficulties with, with grace and you never get flustered and, and the like. Um, and yet if the technology is baffling, um, you know, the, the, how, how do you project that? ongoing uh, image of, of in control. And so there's a vulnerability that I think needs to come to the front where you say to the 24 year old engineer, you're going to come in and coach me, the 60 year old manager on how this bloody zoom thing works. Cause I, I don't get it. That's a, <laughs> that's a real, a moment of vulnerability, which I think is a uh, really important for uh, is individuals, e- even in as hard edged an industry as oil and gas, sh- uh, should be mindful that there's some real merit in in displaying that vulnerability, at least in this in least in this area, because it it uh, will make you more human, make you more authentic, and give you at the same time access to skills in your organization you might not even know exist. Yeah, exactly right. It it does, and and it is to your you know your point on vulnerability. That's really important here, and that's not going to be easy for all leaders no. who haven't been accustomed to operating that way. But you know, one of the core even principles of of leadership, right, is we should be we should be hiring people that are smarter than us. I mean, if we if we expect or think to be the smartest person in the room, then I, I'm not sure we're a great leader. You know? Yeah, <laughs> because, because it is all about well, it's also about mentoring and and succession planning and and grooming and, and all of those things. And what we may be good at as leaders, which is guiding, um, and our strategic, you know, experience from the past, uh, you want that, you want that team that's better at you than most of those things to, to help drive that forward. So, but again, that, that takes some work, right? I don't think that's easy for everybody. And, and depending on where we come from and the traditions we're used to, um, I think there's certainly some work to be done there that could benefit, their organization and, and everyone in it. Um, Chantal, this has been a terrific uh, conversation about the challenges of change, the, the world of the pandemic and what, what leading companies are doing to help their organizations cope with uh, the changes driven, not just by the pandemic, but other uh, d- a, d- adaptations, digital adaptations coming at them. So I, I thank you very much for coming on the show today. Yeah, oh, thank you. It's been uh, it's been a, a great uh, great twenty thirty minute chat. Thanks so much. If if anyone wanted to follow up with you directly to learn more about um, change challenges and other other uh, uh, services that you're you're um, you're in a position to offer, how do they how do they track you down? Yeah, the best way to find us is uh, level.ca and it's level with two V's and also LinkedIn. You know, we all live there, don't we? So <laughs> Chantal Malloy can find me on LinkedIn and just uh, just drop me a note and uh, we're always good about um, contacting folks that way. Got it. So it's level with two V's, um, but it's also two L's and two E's. Uh, it's in fact, it's, <laughs> it's yeah, it's spelled the same forward and backward, if I'm not right. correct. Yeah, it's a palindrome. Exactly right. Yep. So <laughs> level right. the palindrome. And uh, Ch- Chantal Malloy, thank you very much. Um, this has been another episode of Digital Oil and Gas. If you like the show, please press the like button so that others may find it. And I look forward to coming back to you sometime in the future, ideally next week with another episode. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this podcast, be sure to subscribe to the show. 
You can find Digital Oil & Gas on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And please tell a friend about the show. If you have a minute, please leave a review and a rating on iTunes, as that helps others find the show along with other great content. You can follow Jeffrey on Twitter, at Jeffrey Can, or on LinkedIn. Also, look for Jeffrey's new book, entitled Bits, Bites, and Barrels, The Digital Transformation of Oil and Gas, on Amazon and other fine online bookshops. Thanks for listening to this episode of Digital Oil and Gas. The podcast returns next Wednesday, so tune in then.